<laughs> Good morning. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, marriage, and uh, we're going to read the Word of God together. If you can go ahead and stand, read from Ephesians 5, starting with verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And God's people said, Amen. Well, I wanted to say a few things before we get into um, the word here. So the theme is marriage, obviously. That's what this is, section is all about, wives and husbands. So maybe you are not married, and you might think, oh, great, I came today. It has nothing to do with me. Don't think that way. Uh, we have gone through a lot of scriptures that weren't about marriage, but they could apply directly to someone's marriage. The, the principle that's taught or the attitude that you need to have or the, the encouragement that is there, if someone was married, they could take that right into their marriage and apply it to their marriage, even though the section of scripture is not about marriage. The same thing applies here. This is about marriage. But there are attitudes and truths here that you can apply to your life, even if you're not married, even if you never get married. So don't just turn your brain off and think, oh, I'm not married, or, you know, that's a long ways away, or it never happened for me. The other thing I want to say is that the Scripture does not teach you have to be married to be happy. It does not. Who wrote this section of Scripture? Paul. He was what? Never married. Didn't have kids. You don't have to be married or have kids to be happy or to fulfill God's purpose for your life. That is obvious from the scripture here itself, who was written by a man who never married or had kids. <laughs> so God can have a plan for your life, and you can live a happy, fulfilled life, and fulfill God's purposes, and never get married, never have children. Um, I had an aunt, Aunt Rupel. Um, she was engaged when she was young, and then that fell apart, and then she never got married. That happens to some people, it just never happened. She became a school teacher, uh, she taught at the uh, American school in Berlin about the time I was born when the uh, wall was going up in Berlin. Actually, you know, the wall went up when I was born, and the wall came down when my daughter Amy was born. That's how I remember the dates. <laughs> but uh, um, she taught there, and she was a school teacher for a long time, and then she traveled the world, and I mean she traveled the world. The list of countries she did not go to is very small. She went everywhere. She went to uh, New Guinea, for example, places that like are low on off people's list. So she went every place, and she lived a very fulfilled life with you know her family, her career, seeing the world, her church. Never married, didn't have kids. So because we're in a section of scripture about marriage, don't think that the church feels like you have to get married in order to be fulfilled, or God's plan is that everybody gets married, and if you don't get married or have kids, somehow you failed. That is not what the Word of God teaches, even remotely. So I wanted to say that. Now, here's the other thing I want to say. This is a passage of Scripture, especially the section where it talks about wives, where sometimes this is what people do. They read it and they say, oh, how quaint, how old-fashioned. Obviously, this applied in Paul's day, 2,000 years ago. This was the society that he lived in. So it was applicable to people back then. But it's old-fashioned, it's quaint, it doesn't apply to today. I mean, you can read it and appreciate that he was trying to help people in his day, but we need to look for other ways to help people with their marriages today that isn't this. 
because this has to be set aside. It's, it doesn't work today. I encourage you not to do that. And here's, here's a way in which I encourage you not to do that. You need to take some of your presuppositions about what it means for the wife to submit to the husband and set them all aside. <laughs> Just get rid of them. Get rid of them. Those um, assumptions you might have that say, well, this is why it doesn't apply today because this is what a wife submitting to her husband lo it looks like this. And so that's no good. Let's set that aside. Set aside your assumptions, not the Word of God. Don't take the Word of God and set it aside as quaint, old-fashioned, doesn't apply to today. Because the heart of this section is that the motivation for loving your spouse comes from Christ. And the example of how to love your spouse comes from Christ. That's the center of what Paul is talking about. And how, as a believer, can you set that aside? <laughs> I mean, this is an amazing blessing we have as believers to have Christ in the center of our marriage. That's an incredible thing. Don't set that aside. What is better is to understand that this is the Word of God, so it is profound. And when you run across something that's profound, you need to spend time contemplating it, thinking about it, praying over it, and finding your way into what it means for your marriage through the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's the proper response to this section of Scripture, not setting it aside, but understanding that it is Christ-centered, and you need to live in that profoundness in prayer and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And here's one more thing I'm going to say before we start going through the, the Scripture, is this. Every marriage is different, okay? So it just is. So this is, you know, Mary and I, we met in youth group. That's where we met, in youth group. And I remember the first time I thought, wow, I think I like her, is she told a joke on a college winter trip. She told a joke, and it was funny, and I thought, that was funny. And then I told a joke, and she laughed. And some of you, humor was your first connection with the person you got married to. That was our, and we had in common that we were believers, and we were in the same youth group. And so that's how we met. Those were some things we had in common. And uh, we began dating. And uh, 39 years ago, I took her on a trip to Napa. I, we were from California, Ukiah, a little tiny town. It's like the size of Battleground, Northern California. So we drove down to Napa, and uh, I had found this waterfall place. And so I took her there, and I wrote her a song to ask her to marry me. Uh, but I had to explain why I had a guitar with me. <laughs> so uh, I brought things for communion. And I, it's probably, I don't know how spiritual it is to use communion as a front for what you're actually, actually doing. <laughs> but we did have communion, and it was real. So... <laughs> <laughs> so I brought things for communion and had the guitar. It all made sense. We were at a waterfall. And uh, I, sang, I started singing her this song. And in the middle of the song, it says, Oh, Mary, will you marry me? I want you more than all the world can give. And that's how I asked her to marry me. And she said yes. And then we prayed and we had communion together. And, and then we drove to Napa and went out to a fancy place, um, uh, cloth tablecloths. I, we were young, so we weren't at many of those, okay? We were Denny's people. I'll have a super bird, please. <laughs> you know, that was us, um, Denny's. And so it had cloth tablecloths. It was like in this old castle-like building, and uh, I had brought all of my money. So when it was time to pay, I had all of my money, which was a whole pile of, of bills and change, <laughs> like a bucket of change. And... I started getting it out, and Mary said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to pay for the meal. You can't pay like that. <laughs> so our, she had said yes just hours ago. She was already regretting it, I'm sure. <laughs> Who is this man that brings a bucket of change into a fancy restaurant to pay? So she paid with the check, and I paid her back. So... <laughs> And so our relationship began that way. You know, and we were engaged for a year, got married. We've been married uh, 38 years. My point in, in telling the story is everybody's marriage is different. That is not the story of how you met and how you proposed and how you said yes and one of your first embarrassing. That's not your story. Every marriage is different. When you read this scripture and experience the profoundness of what Paul is saying for the husband and wife in their marriage relationship, 
You need to do that uniquely in your marriage. Now, Paul's going to talk about how the husband and wife are one. In a sense, that means everybody else butt out, okay? This is our marriage. And yes, you can get help from people. You can go to marital counseling. Sometimes your, your parents have wise words of advice. But that marriage is your territory, right? It's yours. Well, that includes reading through the Scripture, praying over it, and following the leading of the Holy Spirit. How you work out the profundity, profundity of these words in your marriage is going to be unique to your marriage. Don't let anybody else tell you how you should work this out in your marriage. You can ask for advice if you're going through trouble. You can go to counseling. You can, you know, you can research things like that. But don't let someone tell you, you know, as a husband, you should be doing it this way. You know what? Your marriage is your own. And it's your unique space. And the Spirit can lead you into different things than someone else. That doesn't mean the Word of God changes. That means that you are different than they are. And that God is working in your heart in different ways. You have different giftings, different personalities, different everything. And God is all about variety in how he works out unity. He's, he's all about that. That's what Ephesians has talked about that over and over again. Uh, as we are one, it uh, doesn't mean we're all the same. And that includes marriages. And maybe you have experienced people trying to butt into your marriage. How helpful was that? <laughs> <laughs> butting in is different than offering advice or help. They're different things. And as parents, maybe you have been tempted to butt into your child's marriage, right? And butting in is different than offering help or support. They're different things. Uh, if that marriage loses its oneness and its, you know, us togetherness, it really starts to struggle if everybody else gets to be in the middle of that circle. So, um, so let's start. So first, we're going to talk about a healthy fear creates a healthy attitude. Now, we're going to look at fear, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word reverence is the word fear, phobos, that's the word. Guess why they didn't choose that word for this translation? Because fear has negative connotations, that's why they didn't choose it. So they chose a word that gets at the feeling of it, reverence, respect, Okay, but it is the word fear that's here. Now, in the Bible, it says, what's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's that word, okay, the fear. But in our culture, fear is negative, and uh, many times rightly so. Now, this happens to words. I, I think words are interesting. The word conceited, what does that mean? Full of yourself, yeah. Do you know what the word conceit means? Imagination. When you read Shakespeare plays, it's used positively, conceit. It's imagination. When you talk about somebody being imaginative, is that a negative? No. That's what conceited means, imaginative. But over time, it came to mean you have way too ima many imaginations about how important you are. So it, conceited means all your imaginations are about how important you are, and that's how conceited the word changed. So that happens in a way with a word like fear. But let's just talk about the, the word that's actually there, fear. So healthy fear leads to a healthy attitude, submitting to one another out of fear of Christ. What is the fear of Christ? Well, I think it's knowing that everything that was made was made through him, that he came to this world to lay down his life for me, that his blood is the basis of my forgiveness, that he has prepared a place for me to live in eternity, and that elicits for me a fear, a really healthy respect for who he is. He is not just some guy, <laughs> okay? This is Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, my Redeemer, my only hope. And there is such a deep respect for him that you could call it fear, I align my life with him. I, I make decisions based on what he would want to see. I, I, I speak in a way that would bring him respect. I think of him being present wherever I am. This is a healthy fear, and it brings a healthy attitude because it's connected to submitting to one another. We are 
supposed to submit to one another. We're, we put each other's interests above our own. We think about other people in the family of God as important. We can set aside our own plan to help somebody else. That's what Paul is talking about here. We submit to each other. Uh, we have had a great opportunity to do this during COVID in the family of God. There are many things we had to set aside for the, the um, focus of considering others more important than ourselves, of considering our brother in Christ, our relationship to our brother in Christ as more essential than our opinion about something. Our relationship to our sister in Christ is more important in the fear of Christ than this issue. This is what the fear of Christ means. When I have an opinion or a, a, a practice related to COVID, I do so in the fear of Christ. He, <laughs> everything's been created through him. He laid down his life for me. My forgiveness is based on his blood. He rose from the dead. He prepares a place for me. He's welcomed me into his presence. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in the fear of Christ, I hold my opinion, which means that my relationship with my brother and sister in Christ is far more important. I set aside myself. I submit myself to each other in the fear of Christ. That's what that means. Now, this is directly connected to the marriage section. This verse is transitional. So I, I just, I think it's important to talk about this. This verse, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, is the period on the previous paragraph. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to each other in hymns and songs and spiritual songs. Sing and make melody with all of your heart to the Lord. Give thanks for everything to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Submit to one another in the fear of Christ. That's the period on that section. It's also the opening section in marriage. This is how you know. Look at uh, the next verse. So, the wife follows Jesus, and submission is the key word. Verse 22 says, wives, submit to your own husbands. See that word submit? It's not in the verse. It's not there. When you read the Greek New Testament, that word submit is not there. It just says, wives, to your own husbands. Where does the word submit come from? Previous verse. Submit to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, do that to your husbands. That's how those verses are connected. So verse 21 is a transitional verse. Be filled with the Spirit. Submit to one another in the, in the fear of Christ, period. Marriage. And what Paul is doing here is he's telling us as believers, God is a part of your entire life. You don't just come to church and sing songs and study Scripture, and that's your spiritual life, and then you go on to your work life and your married life and your parenting life and your sports life. and Your, your entire life should be Spirit-filled, all of it including your marriage. And this is what he's doing in this section. Marriage, parenting, work, it's all spirit-filled. It's all about the, doing it in the fear of Christ. Now, fear is, fear is a uh, key word here because this is how this section of Scripture ends. It starts with the fear of Christ, and it ends with wives, fear your husbands. So the word fear is book ends, the beginning and the end of this section. Fear of Christ, wives fear your husbands. And the danger in me using the word fear in this message is that you'll hear it wrong. You'll hear, oh, be terrified, be scared because the person is so mean. No, you can have a, a fear, a healthy respect of someone who you know loves you deeply and who you love deeply, right? Like a parent. Right? You can have a healthy fear of your mom or dad, respect. It, their life impacts your life in a way in which you have this respect or reverence or fear that's just different than other relationships, and that's what's being talked about here. All right, so let's move on. The wife follows Jesus. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything in, to their husbands. 
And so the key word that Paul pulls out for the wife is submitting. Not a very fuzzy, warm word, right? Submit. How, how delightful is that word? Well, hopefully it's more delightful after we look at some scripture here. So the wife is encouraged in the marriage relationship to focus on this attitude of submission to her husband. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't mean what one husband here 25 years ago tried to tell his wife, which was that she needed to do everything he said. Okay, it doesn't mean that, that he was the boss of the family and he was in charge and she was actually sort of a servant. Okay, it does not mean that. And I want to say really clearly, that is not, that's not what you'll get from Mary and I, <laughs> from our marriage, that that's what it means. It doesn't mean that somehow I have to be in charge of everything and make all the decisions and she's my servant. Okay, that it does not mean that. People can get way off base on this because they don't really read the Word of God and what this word submission means in relation to following Jesus. This is all about following Jesus and making Jesus the center of your marriage. That's what it's all about for the wife and the husband. So let's, let's pay attention to it here. Another thing that this scripture says, or another thing that the scripture does not say is the man is always better at everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be ludicrous, okay? In any given marriage, often the wife is better with money or, and I'm just, I don't mean the wife is always better with money. I mean, in a marriage, every marriage is different. Sometimes the wife is better at money. Sometimes the wife is better at making decisions about what car to buy. Sometimes the wife is the one who's more organized. Sometimes the wife is better at making connections with family and friends. Sometimes the wife is the one who actually seems to have a gift of leadership in the sense of people follow her. What I mean is, if you look at the two people in the marriage, there are a whole bunch of people following the wife, nobody's following the husband. Gift of leadership, that's what I mean. So the wife often, um, well, the wife always has her gifts that shine. And sometimes we get really confused because we try to make this a cookie cutter thing. We say, okay, the husband is the head of the house. That means he has to have the gift of leadership, and he, he's the one who has to be better with money, and he's the one who, and he's the one who. Stop doing that. Don't do that. This is a profound scripture about the relationship between man and woman that says something deep. And in your marriage, it's going to look different than it looks in somebody else's marriage because you're different people. Men, your marriage is not going to look exactly like mine because I'm not you. Women, you're not Mary. These things work themselves out differently. Don't look at other people's marriages and just judge yourself or judge them. Follow Jesus. <laughs> this, this is all about Jesus being the center of the marriage. So what is being said? Well, women, Paul is getting at something here that really helps the marriage go well, which is your husband needs you to be supportive and to recognize that God has called him to lead. He needs you to recognize that God has called him to lead. Does that mean he makes all the decisions or that he's smartest about everything or that you never have a say or that you're somehow a servant? It doesn't mean any of those things. It means that you recognize that God has put the burden on him of leadership and you recognize that. And that really helps a marriage. Uh, that's one thing that it means. How this works out in your marriage is how it works out in your marriage. Every marriage is different. You do not judge someone else's marriage. For example, some women are gifted with teaching. And so they're up in front of people teaching all the time. And their husband is not gifted with any sort of public speaking thing at all. People can look at that and say, man, that, that guy needs to be more the head of his house. Shut up. <laughs> OK? 
okay? Be quiet. I mean, God has given her a gift of teaching, and so she's teaching. He has not given that gift to the husband. It, it's not his spiritual gift. It doesn't even fit his personality at all. That's not how he leads in his home. He doesn't have to stand up in front of a group of people and teach them in order to lead in his marriage or to fulfill the call that God has given him. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to fulfill your definition of what it looks like. But he can lead according to the calling that God, the responsibility that God has put on him. He can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. But it may not be obvious to you. You know what? There's a lot of things in someone's marriage that may not be obvious to you because there's a oneness and a privacy to that. This is a profound thing that is said, by the way, ladies. Don't set it aside as old-fashioned, quaint, doesn't apply today. Paul is getting at, at really a heart, a created thing with men and women, a heart thing, a created thing, where the husband really needs his wife to recognize the responsibility that's been put on his shoulders and to support that. He needs that. If she doesn't recognize that, if she denies the reality of that, it hurts the marriage. But how that works out is different in every marriage. Don't set aside the Scripture. Accept the Word of God and pray and be Spirit-led and talk it over how it works out in your marriage. That's what you need to do. Not set it aside as old-fashioned, but follow Christ with all of your heart. And that's my encouragement. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that I, you probably need to hear because it's reality. Um, you know, Mary and I have been married 38 years, and, and uh, I love my wife very much. But just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean somehow I have marriage all figured out. Just because someone's a pastor doesn't mean that their marriage is guaranteed, like, somehow to last. You know, oh, he went to seminary. He's a pastor. Well, they, you know, they're so unlike me that, you know, they're in this different realm. Wish I could be like that. You know, in our church, since I've been here, five of our pastors' marriages have ended. For a church our size, that's, I'm telling you, pastors don't have this all figured out. You don't need, my job is to proclaim the word of God, the, the good news of the gospel this morning, and that's what I'm doing. But you don't need me to save your marriage. You need to be spirit-filled. You need to follow Jesus. That's what you need. That's what all of us need in our marriage. And you might be saying, Steve, I'm not married. I thought you said there was going to be something to apply here. Well, you can ask yourself questions about how Christ-centered am I, am I? What in my life do I set aside for the benefit of another? What relationship am I in where I need to submit because they're in charge or they're given responsibility? You can find all of those things in your life and not be married. Um, I will say as a husband that I feel like I don't make all the decisions, but I feel emotionally like I am a captain on the enterprise. That's how I, that's the responsibility I feel. There are dozens of officers on the Starship Enterprise that have studied deeply, that know far more than the captain about the area that they have studied, right? Jordi LaForge knows a lot more about the warp engines than Picard does. So it's not like the captain knows everything. In many ways, he knows less about an area than every single other person on the ship who has a specialized area, and he knows less. What does, what's the purpose of the captain? Decision-making. What does a good captain do? What do you guys all think? <laughs> when he's gone, who does he put in charge? Someone else. <laughs> but even when he's gone, what does he feel? The responsibility, even though he's delegated it to somebody else. So I feel like I'm in the big chair, is how it's said, on the enterprise. I feel that responsibility. Although I don't make all the decisions. I don't even know everything about as much as my wife. Or, and many times she's in charge and I'm not. Still, I feel that burden. I think that God has designed the husband to have that role, to feel that responsibility. But often he knows far less than his wife, and often the wife actually is the one in command. That's okay. 
You work those things out in your own marriage. Um, but women, you should know that for men, this is an important thing they need to respond to the leading of God on, the responsibility they're given. They need to respond to that. If they don't respond to that, you're going to find uh, problems in other areas. If the, if the man doesn't step up and accept that burden of command, you will find problems. But again, don't set aside this as old-fashioned or quaint. You need to accept the profoundness of it and work it out in your own marriage. Don't ignore it. All right, we're going to move on. The husband follows you. Oh, no, we can't move on. Sorry. Uh, I have, I'm waxing lyrical, so it's always dangerous. So, women, you are following Jesus when you do this. Sometimes people get the impression that, well, the husband follows Jesus, the wife just has to obey. Women, you are following the example of Christ when you do this. Philippians 2 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, like completely equal, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born into the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ emptied himself and became submissive to the will of the Father and obedient to the point of death, and God exalted him. Wife, when you are submitting to your husband, you're following Jesus. Christ has become the center of your marriage. You're following him. He submitted himself. You're following Jesus, and that is, it's life-changing, and it, it can change a marriage. I just encourage you so much to focus on being spirit-filled and following Christ and putting him, him above your own desires as the way to a healthy marriage. I don't know why anybody would set that aside who's a believer. That, I mean, you need to, because Paul uses the word fear or because submissive is not a fuzzy word, that's the reason you want to set this aside. Those are poor reasons to set this aside. You need to think about it and then talk it over with your spouse and figure out what it means in your marriage. Next. The husband follows Jesus with love. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now that's, uh, well, you can go back to that. That's what a calling that is, right? Love your wife. What's our example? Some guy in the Bible who was married. I like this guy. He did a pretty good job. No, the example is Jesus who loved the church and gave himself up for her. The cross is our example. Many wives would just, they would fall down and, crying in joy if their husband took that seriously, if their husband loved them the way Jesus loved the church. I want you to notice, too, notice this is really important. Paul does not use the logical thing of wives, submit yourselves to your husband in the Lord. Husbands, you need to rule over your wives wisely. He doesn't go the direction of husbands rule over your wives. Did you notice that? He says, wives, you need to submit. And then he says, husbands, what do you need to do? Love like Jesus. Gave himself up for her. Next verse. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And then going on. So that he might present to the church, the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So Jesus sets aside everything in order to give his life for the church so the church can be saved, the church can just be dressed in splendor, the church can be all that the church was meant to be. And this is what Paul is going after with the husband. God has given you a burden of command, not so that you can get your way. <laughs> He's given you this burden, this responsibility so that you can give your whole life to your wife, so that she can be splendorous, so that she can experience life 
the way God wants her to experience life so that she can feel loved, so that she can know that she is forgiven, that she is adored, so that you, are, as the husband, this is your task, your lifelong task, is to love your wife the way Christ loves the church. And then he says, because we are members of his body. Now, Paul is going to, um, he's, he's mixing theology and practical and that's what the Bible does all the time, mixes theology and the practical application. So he's going back and forth between a man and woman who are married and Jesus and the church. And this is quite a profound thing he's going to say. He's going to say that Jesus and the church, all of us, we are the, the bride of Christ, men and women, we're the bride of Christ. Jesus and the church are one in the same way that a husband and wife are one. That's quite a profound statement. And so he quotes the Testament, Genesis. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so these two become one in sexual union. And then if they have children, they become one in a different way. I mean, in a sense, your children are the two of you become one. And Paul says this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. He's saying, yeah, the, the husband and the wife together is one. This, this is who we are as the church. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. He is the groom. We are the bride. We become one in the way that a married couple becomes one. There's oneness here. There's togetherness. And what are two things that help this marriage stay one? Well, if the wife realizes that God has placed a responsibility on the shoulders of her husband and she needs to be in fear of that, the fact that God has placed something on her husband's shoulders and she respects that and she submits. And the husband understands his calling is not to just do a fair job of being sympathetic to his wife, but to love her the way Jesus did. Like in John, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I what? I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is the example for both. The wife who empties herself and becomes submissive, even to the point of death. God exalts that. And Jesus is the example for the husband, who is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. That's the ultimate love for his wife. Do you see the emptying that both do? These are both about emptying. They both are. Sometimes people get this wrong, and they're like, well, the wife has to empty herself and just do whatever the husband wants. That is not what it says. <laughs> How do you think Jesus loved the church? By emptying himself and laying down his life. These are both about emptying what you want to grasp and putting the other above yourself. They both are. But they have kind of a nuance here. And you, we need to pay attention to the nuance. Wives, your husbands need to feel that you recognize that burden on his shoulders and you support that. Husbands, you can't assume it. Your wife needs to feel what? Loved. She needs to feel loved. I think that's profound. Now, not every man and woman is the same. Not every marriage is the same. But I tell you, you're on the right track. If the wife knows her man needs to feel that she thinks he's awesome and she supports him, and if the husband knows that he has to constantly remind his wife that she is just loved, the most important thing in his life, do you think that might help a marriage? And both are Christ-centered, and they both follow Jesus' example of emptying themselves? That's the profoundness of this Scripture. Why would you set that aside? Well, because today, you know, we don't like the word fear, we don't like the word submit, or it, it's disrespectful to women. You're reading it wrong, <laughs> okay? You need to read what it says, actually says, and, and picture how this works itself out, and then do it in your marriage under the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's only His power that will help you do this anyway. And every marriage will be unique. Everyone is unique. Every single marriage is unique. Every person is unique. Well, wait a minute. I thought the Word of God was solid and it was the same. It is solid. 
You don't think the Word of God can't apply to your marriage, which is different than their marriage, or to you, who are different than your brother? It works, them, it works itself out differently in you because you're a different person. The Word of God doesn't change. The Word of God is amazing. What else works itself out in all people or all marriages? It's just, it's tremendously amazing. It says what it needs to say to change your life. And not just yours. It's not just like, okay, this is life-changing for people who are sort of like this. But the other people, it doesn't change their life because it doesn't fit their personality or their outlook. The Word of God is life-changing. Now, I have building a strong marriage as the last verse here. Verse 33 says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So, the husband needs to remember that they are one. When, she hurts, when he hurts his wife, he's hurting himself. They are one person. They're one, inseparable. She is him. If you don't think that's profound, think about this. How does this apply to considering divorce and defining happiness? Do you know how many people sometimes think about their marriage and they think, well, you know, I'd be happy if I was just not with them. Well, how does it change the way they think if you can't do that, (laughs) if you are one? And the question is not, how can I get away from them, or I'd be happy without them, but what do I need to do for this person who is me? I need to love her as myself. She is me. We are one person. This um, profoundly changes an outlook on a person's life. You know, I would be happy in life if only my spouse was this, or my spouse was that, or my spouse was this way, or my spouse was this way, rather than this attitude of, I follow Christ who emptied himself and wanted what the Lord wanted and laid down his life. And Jesus understood what submission meant. It meant winning the church to himself. And he understood what love meant. It meant laying down his life to win the church to himself. And having that attitude in the center of your marriage. Now, you can't talk about marriage in one message, so we're going to talk some more next week about it. Today we have gone through the Scripture about the basic thing that is said here for the wife and the husband in this section. Next week we're going to talk about marriage. We're still in this passage, but I'm going to talk about some other things that can be helpful in a marriage. Um, And so we'll spend another week on marriage. So again, this is a difficult thing that you enter into when you say, I do. I mean, like I shared, five pastors from this church, their marriage ended. This is a difficult thing. Paul is pretty passionate here about what needs to happen in a marriage so that this one can remain. Um, Some of you have, uh, you've had marriages end and um, they have not worked out. And the Bible knows about that too. And God is still able to work in your life and you can be called to his purposes and it's not like all hope is gone or somehow you're you're viewed as, uh, you know, not as as loved a believer as someone who's still married. So I don't have time to say everything because this this touches all areas. Um, I realize that some people have been through a, a marriage relationship where there has been extremely abusive thing going on, and it's hard to even understand this scripture in the light of that. I don't have time to, to touch on that. The Bible knows about that too, abusive relationships and how that af- Im- impacts everything. What can be true in a marriage also is that one spouse pursues being Christ-centered and the other does not, right? Even believers, you can have two believers and one is pursuing being Christ-centered and the other is self-centered believer. That makes things even harder, doesn't it? It just makes things hard. But the calling that we have is the calling of Christ. Who were we when Jesus died for us? We're described as his enemies. And so the calling to love your spouse is connected to some of those hard things that Jesus said. You love people who love you? Great. Hey, even people who don't like God can do that. Try loving your enemies. Now you're following me. And 
honestly, people like to apply that verse everywhere except their marriage. And it applies to your marriage. When we follow Jesus, we follow him in every part of our life, our marriage, our parenting, being a child, and tr how we treat our parents, uh, our work, uh, our relationship to our neighbors. Every part of our life becomes Christ-centered, and the only way to do it is to be spirit-filled. And it does not mean that it is simple or easy or plain sailing at all. It just does not. But what you can't do is set aside the Word of God and say, I I'm a modern person, I have a better idea. You need to digest, digest the profoundness of what God says about marriage, pray in the Spirit for guidance, and follow His leading. That, and that doesn't make everything easier, by the way, because you're following Jesus. When He obeyed His Father, did everything become easier? No. No but it became significant and life-changing. It became that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much.